this month we're going to be talking about sight fishing, um, you know, close to the beach. So all the species you can catch, um, you know, either in a boat on the beach or from the beach, you know, fishing. And it's, we're going to be talking about sight fishing. So visually being able to see the fish, presenting a bait to it and trying to catch it that way. So, um, you know, real quick, we want to, you know, thank Flounders for giving us this place to, to do this seminar and, and um, you know, providing this, this food for you guys. So let's give Flounders a little round of, round of applause here. Good luck. You know, one more thing too, guys. We have, make sure we need to take care of our, our waitresses and bartenders and stuff out here tonight. Um, you know, they're, we heard there may have been a little bit of an incident last month. We don't, you know, some people walked out on their checks when it started raining, that kind of stuff. So um, just make sure you take care of them. They, they, they do a good job for us. I hear they got a lot of people to take care of. So you make sure you make sure you take care of our, our waitresses and bartenders and stuff out here tonight. All right, guys, we'll, we'll get going. So tonight we're meeting is, uh, is Captain Kenny Way with Real Way Charters. Me and Kenny grew up sight fishing on the on the piers and, and from boats and stuff up here on our beaches. We, so it, it, sight fishing is one of our favorite way to, to go fishing or our favorite things to do. So, um, you know, we haven't really touched a whole lot on sight fishing uh, in one of these seminars. So we can go over a lot of information. We'll touch on a lot of species and, and hopefully, you know, give you a good rundown of what you can expect if you want to just get into sight fishing. So, um, you know, as we always start out, we talk about kind of like the rod and reels, the gear setup you're going to need when you're sight fishing. Uh, Kenny, you know, it, let's say you need two rod and reels to, to get started in, in, the, in the sight fishing uh, on the beach, whether it's from Pompano or Redfish or Cobia Tarpon, um, what, what kind of rod and reel setups are, are you looking for? And is it something specific that you need uh, when you, when you want to go sight fishing on the beach? Uh, I would say the majority of us are going to have, uh, you know, a bigger combo for your Cobia and stuff like that. So it's going to be anywhere from a 65 to an 8500 size reel, probably. Um, and then for your smaller stuff, like your Pompano, maybe your Reds, like a 3500, 4500, uh, Shimano pin, any, any, you know, really whatever you prefer. We use, Tyler's got some Shimano stuff. We all have pin stuff. That's really up to the person. Um, but we usually do have two different sizes. Um, like I say, just in case, you know, you see your Pompano, your Reds, or if you got something bigger, like if you get lucky and a couple of swims down the beach, you want to have, we usually try to have two or three different sizes. So, as, as far as rod goes, is there an advantage to having a certain size rod if you're, if you're sight fishing down the beach? So, with the braid now, um, a lot of people seem to be scaling down a little bit, but you still see all these guys pumping up fishing with 10 or 11 foot rods. Uh, go on, keep going. I would, most people are still using 10 or 11 foot rods, um, pumping up fishing for sure. But the main reason they're doing that, they're trying to get their line above the waves when they're sitting them in their spikes. Uh, as far as like, if I'm literally throwing at Pompano, if I see them come down the beach, six or seven foot's what I'm using. We're using real light gray, so you can throw it a pretty good ways. Um, but again, if you're just sitting there throwing out sand fleas, most of those guys are running 10, 11, 12 foot rods. Yeah, you know, and also, um, you know, if, if you're fishing from a boat, you know, sight fishing, let's say you're tarpon fishing or something like that, or Kobe fishing, I think you do get a little bit of an advantage having an eight or nine foot rod. Versus like a, a seven foot rod on that 6,500 size or the bigger spinning reel. So, um, you know, that, that, uh, turn yours off when I'm talking. And, uh, you know, the, the bigger, the bigger rod, the bigger rod in, in the braided line gives you more casting distance. So, uh, when you're side fishing, casting distance can be important. And pretty much now we use braid for any kind of sight fishing. Um, and we're going to pair that braid with a, with a fluorocarbon or mono, monofilament leader. So, um, your braided line helps you throw, and then your mono or fluorocarbon leader is going to be um, what helps you, you, you know, your bait or where your lure to be, in, you know, they can't see the line whenever you're, you're trying to fish for them there. So um, the, the, these bigger setups, I think if you're if you're fishing for, let's say, Cobia, Jack Crevel, or a big redfish or a tarpon, um, you know, probably 50 or 60 pound fluorocarbon, maybe a three foot piece of fluorocarbon on there. Um, smaller setup for pompano, redfish, that kind of stuff. We use uh, 20 pound is a good go-to uh, for the leader material on that. And uh, pretty much all our connections are going to be spliced. So splice connections, whether it's a uni knot, an Albright knot, an FG knot, whatever you're comfortable, whatever you're good at tying, um, is, it's going to be better. You can use a small swivel also if that's what you know how to use and that's what you have. Uh, just just use the smallest swivels you can get away with. You don't want to use a big giant swivel trying to throw it a pompano. It's just not going to look that natural to them in the water. So, 
Um, you know, th that's our basic, you know, rundown on our rod and reels, and, and they're very versatile. So you, you can catch Cobia, Tarpon, Jeff Gravel on the on the bigger rods, um, Pompano, and Redfish on the on the inshore styles, the, the smaller spinner rods, um, eight or nine foot rods for the the bigger ones, and then uh, seven or seven and a half foot's going to do good for the the Pompano and Redfish that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, one thing we can talk about is um, get into first. Any questions on rod and reel or setup or anything like that, guys, or line while we're, we're touching on it? If, if any time you have any questions, guys, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll kind of get to you and, uh, and and try to get your question answered here. But so we'll, we'll get into maybe talking about a certain type of a species. So, um, you know, cobia fishing in our beach has been a, a thing that people have done for a long time, and it's, it, it used to be very good. Uh, cobia fishing is not as good as it, it used to be. Um, the numbers of fish just aren't around on our beach anymore like they were, but it's still something that, you know, you can, you, if you put some time into this in the next month or so, uh, you got a decent chance of catching one. Um, so, you know, some advantages, if, if you have a, a, a boat with a, a tower, it's going to help you in any kind of site fishing. Uh, you can definitely catch plenty of fish standing on the, uh, the you know, the top of your, deck, your front deck of your boat or on the pier. Um, but, you know, Real quick, just a basic rundown. Uh, let's say you're going to go cobia fishing in your, your boat with a tower crab. Um, what are what are some things that you know maybe you're you're looking for, or um, how you're going to start out your how you just start out your trip if you're going to go looking for cobia? Start with baiting everything too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like he was saying, most of these guys, if they are doing the cobia fishing, they definitely want to be in a boat with a tower. Some people don't have that option, so. We've seen boats out there with ladders, like literally strapped to the bow. That you just want to get up above, up above your deck a little bit. The higher you get, the better you can see down into the water. Um, most of us are going to use anybody that really takes it seriously are going to use a rod like Tyler's got sitting here. It's an eight or a nine foot rod. Um, it doesn't have to be a custom one. We spend some money on them, so his is a little bit of a nicer one. Uh, like he was saying, uh, generally 40, 50, 60 pound leader. Um, if the fish are acting right, I try to use 60, but if they're being kind of funny and they don't want to necessarily bite, we scale down on stuff like that. Um, a lot of times, uh, fish baits work really well for them. So, like, if you can get a pen fish or maybe, like, a ruby lips, um, anything like that, you want to try to have him in the live well or ready just in case you do actually see one of these things. You want to try to have something decent to throw at him. All of the tackle stores here locally are going to have eels. Um, eels are one of the easiest things to use. They're kind of a pain to hook, but they stay alive really well. So you can go buy a half a dozen of them or whatever for your day. Pretty much, if you do go buy them, you, you should be good for the day because they stay alive really well. So that's a really easy thing to use. Yeah, so, you know, cobia fishing, um, these fish are migrating down our beach. They're coming from the east going west. So we, we typically go out our pass and start heading east, and you're just going to look for them. I mean, you know, people say, what do they look like? It looks like a cobia swimming in the water. Um, you know, it, it, it really, it's like, once you see one, like, you'll know exactly what I'm saying. Like, uh, say, does it look like a, you don't see a flash or you don't see this? It's just a brown fish swimming near the surface. Um, you know, it doesn't really look like a shark. It, it, some people will think it's, oh, is that a shark at first? But, um, you know, but it, it's just they, they swim right on the surface, maybe within... Uh, a foot of the surface and they're you know they're decently easy to see most days they kind of glow so you know it, this is a um a, a type of fishing where you're looking for maybe one fish or two fish swimming together so uh, it's, it's a lot of water out there and you have to cover you have to look you know scan the whole time you're out there um, we typically start you know maybe uh, a half mile off the beach or up to a mile or two miles off the beach looking for them um, but you're just going to cruise up and down east to west looking for these uh fish so um when, when you do see one, you want to try to present your bait in front of the fish. Um, so you want to, you know, don't want to run right up on top of them. You could spook the fish. So, um, you know, you want to throw, lead the fish a little bit when you throw. It, you know, we typically throw a bait first. They will eat jigs. They'll eat swim baits and bucktail jigs and that kind of stuff. But um, I think your chances are a little bit better when you do have uh, either a fish type bait, like a pinfish or ruby lips or a live eel. So, um, you know, those are going to be your first goes. Um, if you want to throw a jig at it, if you can't reach it with a bait, throw a jig towards it, and I'll eat a jig as well. So, um, you know, you want to give yourself the best opportunity when you when you do encounter these fish. Um, so you, you know, kind of have your stuff already poked, already ready in a in a bucket with a 
a bubble box on there or something like that, or a bait in the log well ready to go, and uh, and then pr- try to present the bait to them when you when you do see them. Um, you know, the, the, they're pretty active most of the time. So you know, a lot of times the bait will hit the water, the fish will turn around and eat the bait pretty quick, and then you know you have them on. You, we use circle hooks or treble hooks for them. If you're using an eel, circle hooks going to work better. Treble hook works very well for the fish type baits. Um, and you know, but like we were talking about earlier, it's not as good as it used to. And I think if you see one, if you see one or two fish in a day, this you know these days, it's it's a pretty good day. So um, it, it's kind of a low percentage, but it is an awesome fishery. We we grew up doing it. We love cobia fishing. And um, you know, maybe one day they will come back. We'll be able to catch them a little more. So. Um, that's just a quick rundown on, on cobia. Any questions on, on cobia in particular? And when we get done, y'all can come up and ask any specific questions about anything we talked about tonight or anything off topic. We're more than happy to you know answer some of those questions. So there's a quick rundown on cobia. Cobia used to be the most popular thing to start fish on the beach, and now it's like almost the least popular. So um, another thing that we like to catch, and in, in we, we catch quite a few up and down the beach, is like uh, is, is bull red, bull red fish. Um, if you're going to sight fish bull redfish, uh, what time of years can you catch the bull redfish on the beach? And, and where would you start with when you're when you're trying to catch a redfish? Um, so realistically, we do have the bulls um, up and down the beach pretty much all year long. But I will say it's probably better in the spring, so this time of year, and in the fall, maybe September, October, November, something like that. Um, generally, you'll see singles. You might see wads of 8 or 10 or 12. Every now and then, you'll see a really big school. Uh, they can be like anything else. So sometimes they're going to eat everything you throw in front of them. Like the lower hit the water, you got one instantly. And sometimes you're going to throw everything you got at them, and they're just not going to bite. That's just how they are when they're traveling like that. Um, but a pompano jib will work. Um, if they're being picky, sometimes we'll throw like a whole shrimp at them. Um, a lot of guys catch them just to, just uh, pompano fishing too. If you got bait out there sitting, um, yeah. So where are you where are you going to start looking for? So Cobia, we're going to end up a little further up the beach, like half mile to a mile. When you're when you're looking for redfish, where are you going to be looking for them at? Like what what zone are you going to start looking? How far down the beach? That kind of stuff. Uh, I would say generally they're you know within casting distance. Um, Sometimes they're literally 10 or 15 or 20 feet off the shoreline. Um, I would say most of the time they're probably out there 20 or 30 yards, like right, maybe right outside the rollers. Um, but, you you know, you'll definitely see them, especially if there's any number to them at all. It'll be kind of like a dark mess out there moving down the beach. Um, and the same thing he was saying, too, if you kind of do find a school of the reds and you kind of see them moving in a certain direction, you definitely want to try to get out in front of them. Don't throw behind them because they're not going to see it. Yeah, and, you know, we, we do catch quite a bit of redfish if we try. We have someone that wants to catch them this time of year. We come out the pass, start heading down Fort Pickens. I'd say usually bet- within between the pass and, like, the the ranger station on the beach, um, up there on the sand, you know, pretty close. There's going to usually be some redfish uh, in that zone. Um, you can catch them up and down the whole beach. You can go west out of the pass. Water's not typically as clear that direction, but, you know, we get a lot of clean water right there near our pass. Uh, and this is also a, a fish that you can catch from the beach on a, on a nice day. Um, casting off the beach, you can actually, you know, we're in there in the boat throwing towards the beach, and there's people on the beach that can easily reach the fish where we catch them a lot of days. And that's something you can walk down Fort Pickens with a, you know, a, a lure and a, and a spinning rod, and you can catch them from the beach. Um, also on the beach piers, you have opportunities to catch these redfish. And, you know, like, like Kenny said, that some days they're super picky and, uh, you know, we only can get them to eat a, a live, a, a live shrimp on a, a jig head or a pompano jig, or even sometimes they'll eat a pinfish and that kind of stuff. Cigar minnows we can catch them on. Um, but, but they will take a Berkeley gull or a pompano jig, uh, tip with a sand flea. Um, they'll eat swim baits, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, some, if you see some boats creeping, if you come up the pass and there's boats creeping along the shore, pretty close to shore, uh, up there against the beach, they're probably looking for redfish. And we catch, you know, a lot of them without any kind of tower, um, just stand on the front deck or kind of, you know, up on your kickstand of your console. And you can, uh, you can see these fish pretty good. And, and once you see them, you know, like sometimes it'll just be like a little dark school of fish. Like you can't really tell what it is. Maybe it looks like grass. And you get there, you see the fish moving. So, um, like like Kenny said, you want to throw, try to lead the school of fish with your bait. You don't really want to splash on top of them. You want to lead them and have your bait even sitting in front of them on the bottom is a good place to start. And you just want to, you're going to want to bump that jig or, and if it's a, if it's a bait, you let it do its thing. But if you have a jig, you want to just pop it right off the sand, let it settle back down into the sand and, and just keep doing that process until the fish 
you know, either you get a bite or they're, you know, past your bait, you need to recast. So um, I followed these fish up on the beach for an hour and got multiple shots, caught multiple fish out of these schools. Um, sometimes, like you said, some days they just eat anything that hits the water. Some days they don't, but it's a it's an awesome fishery um, that we do potentially have all year other than the summertime. We catch them in the fall. And, um, you know, they're, they're all, I'd say 90% of the time are the upper slot fish uh, in the, you know, 28 to 40 inch range. There can be really big ones out there too. So that's a cool fishery. Also, what else, if you're looking for those redfish, what else can you find this time of year in the same zone? Um, so um, a lot of times students tell me, like say you're looking down the beach and you see a big black cloud or something coming. It could be a school of black drum. Uh, we're about to start getting a bunch of uh, jackarels that are going to be pushing down the beach, and they're all going to be pretty much in that same range. They, you, for the most part, you should be able to reach them from shore. Um, they just love coming right down the beach, especially down there by the pass. There's usually some bait balls down there, so they're all down there kind of looking for that. But jackarels, black drum, and redfish. Um, and while you're doing all this, you'll definitely see some schools of pompano. The pompano the last 10 days have been really good. Yeah, so uh, you know, Jack Curvell's, they eat, you can catch them on the same setup, you know, the, the smaller setup or the bigger setup. The the 4,000 size inshore rod catching a 20 pound jack is, it, it's an awesome fight. I mean, they're, they're going to take a lot of your line. Sometimes if you hook two and they go opposite directions, you get spooled on one reel. Um, but no, they, they, they're very apt to take lures too. So we catch them on um, top water lures like a, a, a chugger or a, a, a popper. And then we also catch them on any kind of soft plastic swim baits, bucktail jigs. Um, these these spread style bucktail jigs work really well um, for them. And, and the redfish will eat these a lot of times too. So, um, you know, any kind of, you know, bucktail jig this size or, um, you know, a little white jig this size is, is good things to have when you're, when you're you know, want to sight fish on the beach. Um, like, like Kenny said, though, too, in the same range, and, and I'd say anywhere between uh, the pass and the pier, is an excellent place to do a lot of sight fishing. So another thing you can catch, we talked, he just said, is if you'll see pompano schools. So um, pompano are, are definitely the most tricky to see, um, and, and they're going to they're they're going to be in schools of it could be thirty fish, it could be one hundred and fifty fish, it could be five hundred fish. So and these fish are also migrating from east to west, and, and you'll see the the school of fish. They'll be they'll be traveling, you know, down the beach, and they'll be somewhere on the first sandbar typically. So the so whenever you're looking for the pompano, Kenny, what are you looking for in the water? What do you see? How do you notice that it's a pompano? Um, all this also depends on the day as well. So sometimes you'll see like a dark cloud uh, if it's a whole bunch of them. Some people are actually seeing them flashing and rolling in the waves. Um, every now and then, like when the water is real clear and the sun's up on top, you almost see like a shadow moving. You don't necessarily see the fish. You'll see a shadow. And that's that's him. You're actually seeing, you know, his shadow because they're, the pompano are definitely going to be the hardest ones to see. They're almost the same colors as sand when they're moving through. So you really have to pay attention looking for those. And once you see them a few times, then you'll kind of pick it up. But they are definitely probably the hardest one to pick up. Yeah, and um, and, and the last three things you're talking about, the redfish, the pompano, the jack curvel, these are all going to be uh, fish that are, the, the fishing's going to be better for these when it's not very rough. You want very little wave action and clear water near the beach. So some days if it's rained or if it's been rough, it's going to be super muddy up there. These are not good days that you, you want to try to go sight fishing on the beach. You know, it's better to be a, either a north wind or just a, a small little roller out of the south or southeast. This is not going to be breaking where you can get your boat in there and uh and, and not you know get washed up on the beach or you know get in a bad situation so um you know the calmer calmer weather is definitely better and uh like you said these pompano can be very tricky to see but once you see some or you notice some then uh they're easier to pick up like you said the shadow is what we see a lot of times first you see the shadow or you see a flash sometimes they'll come up and roll but typically it's going to be a big school of fish sometimes you're going to get confused and throw in a school of bluefish or spanish but still, those are also, you know, fun fish to catch, and, and you'll see those uh, while you're looking for pompano down the beach as well. So same situation. You're going to come out the pass and uh, start heading towards the east, um, you know, within, you know, maybe 100 yards of the of the beach, and, and you're going to look for these schools of fish. And I'd say on that first sandbar is a better spot. Do you ever see them on the second sandbar? Uh, yeah, we definitely do, especially the guys on the piers. Um, a lot of times, like if you have a real rough day, the guys are actually fishing out there a little deeper. Um, usually, if you know if that water gets a little bit murky, you can move out a little deeper. And sometimes those fish are out there on that second bar. 
obviously if you were on the beach, it'd be kind of hard to reach those. Um, but the, the guys on the, on the piers definitely catch them out there deeper on the second sand bar. And, um, you know, and all of these fish we're talking about are, are very fun to catch from the pier, too. So our Pensacola Beach Pier is still closed for another couple of weeks. We've got Navarre Beach Pier is, a, is an awesome place to go. And, you know, I'd say, you know, at least half of the fishing done out there is sight fishing, whether it's for Spanish mackerel or pompano or redfish or cobia. Um, tarpon so the, the piers are excellent places to go just to even say hey what what does this fish look like in the water what am i going to be looking for if i'm in the boat or on the beach and uh and, and they're a lot of you know a lot of fun to even just go out there and watch if you're a little bit intimidated by the pier uh, but you can definitely figure out what you're looking for and, and see how guys present baits to these fish and that kind of stuff so uh, the pier could be a great place to observe or even try out some sight fishing up there on the beach um, so the, the, the pompano is there, um, you know, they could be on the, the first sandbar. I'd say typically they're in probably less than about 10 foot of water, seven foot of waters where you can see them the best. Um, they can definitely be other places and, um, you know, but it's not as, it's not as easy to find them and j like blind jigging from the pier is pretty easy because the fish are be coming to you. And that, that's just where you don't see them. You're just throwing the jig, uh, the pompano jig. And, and we didn't talk about the pompano lure or bait yet, but. Um, usually just a little nylon jig with a lead head. It could be orange or pink or, or white or yellow or chartreuse. Um, you know, it, it, we always kind of take a variety of sizes too. Sometimes you need to throw a little further, so you use maybe a half ounce, but typically there's probably um, three eighths or a quarter ounce. You know, we use that size sometimes, maybe even up to one ounce. So um, I always have a few different colors, a few different sizes of jigs in my tackle bag whenever I'm, you know, trying to do the sight fishing. And um, in, in a pompano too, that they 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 feed on sight as well as smell. So sometimes you know you, you see them, they they kind of get fired up on your jig, but they won't eat it. You know, the the technique that we use when when, we, when we're jigging for pompano is a, a quick quick bounce and let it fall back to the sand. Quick bounce, let it fall back to the sand. You don't want to like you know c continuously reel it or remove it like your Spanish mackerel fishing. It, you just want to do like a short hop and then let it hit back in the sand. Um, sometimes when it hits that sand, it, it creates a little poof in the sand and then kind of gets their attention. But um, do you like to put any kind of scent or anything on your jigs whenever you are throwing a pompano jig at a school of pompano? So, yes. Um, some days when it's real windy, if we are on the pier, uh, we may try to not put anything on there and just hope that they're going to bite it. But if it's a calm day and they're acting kind of picky, uh, a lot of people will tip their jigs with like a sand flea. Any of your local stores are going to have the sand fleas this time of year. Um, but there's two or three different things that'll work also. You can use like a piece of field shrimp. Um, the fish bites work really well. The uh, You can use like the little gulp. What's the gulp bites? They, it's just like, it's like a fish bite, but gulp makes them the same thing. You just put it right on the back of the jig and it just gives them something when they're getting kind of fired up and looking at, you, you know, your lure or whatever you're throwing at them. And then they get behind it and they smell it. It's just that much more of a chance for you to catch one for sure. You know, and, and, um, yeah, this is also something you can just do, you know, maybe for an hour um, throughout your fishing trip. Let's say you're intro fishing or fishing on the pass, maybe hit the jetties or catch some Spanish and then just kind of ease off down the beach and see if you can see anything. So we do it on our trips a lot, um, you know, especially if it's a pretty day, you can see it on the beach. Uh, just start easing down towards the east and, uh, you know, maybe get a shot at a redfish, a pompano and a jack Carvel all within 30 minutes of each other. So, um, you know, it can be a, a very rewarding type fishing um, and uh, it definitely takes a little bit of skill. Um, you know, how important is casting and all this and, and being able to put your lure or whatever where you want it to go uh, when you are sight fishing? Um, so that is a pretty big part of it. Uh, obviously, if you're throwing at 500 redfish, it should matter how good of a caster you are because, I mean, if there's 500 of them, hopefully you can get it out in front of one of them. But uh, as far as the pompano and the, I would say the jacks, they're they're all, like you were saying, they're moving east to west, and for the most part, they're going to be moving pretty quickly down the beach trying to get to wherever they're going. So if you see that big school of jacks coming or you see your pompanos, the redfish are kind of slower, but if you see your pompanos and your jacks, um, I would say biggest thing is try to find out, you know, kind of which direction they're going. should be east to west. Um, and then you definitely want to just try to get it out in front of them. Every now and then you can land in the middle of them and that'll work. But I would definitely try to get it out in front of them and, uh, you know, a pretty good bit if you can let them come to it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even practice casting can be good too before you even get out there. Maybe before you see anything, uh, maybe see something in the water, aim at it, try to throw at it. So if, if you don't have a very accurate or, or quick cast, if you're throwing 100 miles in the air and it's not going where you want to go, probably not going to be that effective 
at seeing a fish and then throwing at it. Uh, we have a question over here. He asked about tide, so that, that could be a good question too. Incoming or outgoing? Um, it, it seems like when I'm fishing on the beach, I like the incoming or high tide a little better. Um, if it's a you know tide super far out or ripping out, um, for one thing, you're gonna have dirtier water around the pass where we do a lot of our our sight fishing, and, and also it's gonna be a little shallower if they're close to the beach. It's not gonna be as effective. So incoming high tide is ideal, but if it's still clear down the beach and it's a a low tide, you still have a, sh a shot at, at catching stuff, especially redfish. They're not as tied you know um sensitive around the pass because they, they, they could be there all year so um the pompano for sure jacks for sure uh that kind of stuff is, is definitely tied dependent um but for sure you know the the you know the being able to cast accurately be familiar with your rod and reel setup and, and practicing can make a huge difference um, especially when you get out there and you see a school of 100 pompano and they're coming to you and you want to be able to throw where you want to throw and, uh, and, and place your lure in front of that school of fish. So um, that can definitely, you know, mess you up if you don't have a very accurate cast or you have a wild cast. Um, one, one other thing, like, do you do anything to prevent the lure from landing really hard in the water? Do you slow it down or do you just stop it before it hits the water? What can you do to, to have a, a better entry with these, these lures when you throw um, at a, a fish? Yeah, so that's another thing that you're going to have to practice. Um, you can throw it real hard, and then right before you see the lure hit the water, you can kind of stop it with your finger, and usually it'll make a lot smaller of a splash. Um, definitely do that with a pompano. You don't want to scare them. Um, the redfish and the jacks, sometimes they do like a little bit of commotion. Jacks especially, like if you're using a top water or something like that, you're making a bunch of noise anyway. So sometimes that kind of excites them. But the pompano and the reds are the ones that you're definitely going to want to try to stop the lure before it hits and make the, you know, the least amount of sound and everything as possible. That way it's the most natural to him that it could be. Yeah, and, um, you know... It I don't do the pumping up fishing from the boat a whole lot, but, you know, I really enjoy it. And once you catch a few and kind of get it figured out, it can be an awesome way to catch this pompano. Sometimes you can catch your six your limit in, like, 20 minutes if the schools keep going through. So another thing, too, like, if you see a school of fish, is like, does that mean that the rest of them are going to be probably in the same, like, same distance off the beach and same area? Or could they be staggered out? So they can, obviously, they have tails, and they can go they want to. But I would say, generally, if you find a couple of schools of fish um, on, like, a certain line or a certain distance away from the beach, a lot of your ones the rest of that day, or at least for the next few hours, they tend to kind of follow each other. So if you got some out there on the second sandbar and you see some, stay out there on the second sandbar. But if they're right up in there close and five foot of water, you're probably going to see the majority of them right there. They all seem to kind of follow each other. Yeah, you know, and that's one thing, too, like, you know, getting like figuring out the pattern of these schools of fish uh, especially the migrating fish the jacks and the pompano they're, they're trying to they have an objective and uh they all kind of think the same way as the the next school behind them um and and they could they're probably all going to be in the same maybe 50 or maybe 30 yard zone uh, whether it's on top of the sandbar or right off the sandbar um you, you'll definitely notice that in the same day saying within the same time frame the fish are going to be doing the same thing so um also, time of day. Is there a time of day that you think is better when you're looking for these fish down the beach than others? Uh, generally, most people like to let the sun get up a little bit, so 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. But a lot of times, your pompano will bite pretty early first thing. So if you can get out there and you got a nice clear day, like you were saying, with maybe a north wind and the waves aren't real big, you know, you can definitely have a good chance of catching them early in the morning. But it is going to be easier, you know, in a boat or off the beach to see them, you know, around midday because you're that's going to be your best chance to see them when the sun's up in the air yeah the, the sun is definitely your friend when you're sight fishing for any type of fish um you know it, it will definitely allow the fish to see you a little better they'll, they'll have more vis visual on on you when you're trying to catch them but um it, on a, a super overcast day um you know can't see into the water very good your chances are going to be very slim to be able to sight fish uh you know any kind of fish up there on the beach so um you know low sky sunny um, light wind is going to be absolute best conditions and you will get some days like that in the spring um you know we do get a lot of southeast winds it can get very rough that be maybe a day where you go to the pier and look out there when it's a little rougher um you can definitely still catch these fish on the pier when it's rougher um you know when you can't go out in the boat or walk the beach and be very effective so um you know there's a lot of options here and uh and you know there's a, a lot of stuff that you can do um you know 
as far as trying to sight fish, whether whether it be the pier or the boat or the beach or anything like that. So uh, any questions on redfish or pompano or, or jet for or anything down uh, the beach anymore, or we'll turn to, to tarpon fishing. So uh, if you wanted to go sight fishing for tarpon, when when is that going to happen on our beach? Uh, and, and what time, time frame is that going to be? So generally, again, uh, I would say that most of these guys really started looking for some tarpon, I would say about the second week of June, uh, pretty much through July is when we get our main push. Uh, you can definitely do it out of a boat. They are a little bit shy of a boat here. So you're, uh, if you see like a nice school of fish coming down the sandbar, these things are usually on the second sandbar. Sometimes they're on that drop off. A lot of times you can see them rolling. They'll actually come up top and like stick their heads out of the water. You'll see a whole school doing that. So if you see them, you know, a couple hundred yards away, you want to try to get your boat out. And uh, we use trolling motors all the time. Just turn the big engine off and try to get to where you think the fish are coming to you and then kill everything. You want to be real quiet for tarpon. Uh, especially out of a boat. And these uh, swim baits are probably one of the most popular things for them. You'll want to use one a little bit bigger than this one. Um, like I think it's like a six inch. Um, any kind, uh, they're not real picky on that. A lot of people like white, the yellow and the pink, all that works. The tarpon, they love the swim baits, so they don't seem to be real picky on those. Um, but that time of year, June and July, they're chasing big schools of LYs down the beach. So if you have a Saviki rig and you can catch like a couple, three or four inch LYs, that's what they're eating when they're coming down. So you cannot go wrong with that. Um, and for whatever reason, uh, not necessarily like in Panama City or in Destin, but here, the tarp in the last 10 years are actually easier to catch off of the piers because there's a million pounds of LYs around those piers and those tarp and know it. And they're going to come to that pier and feed on the LYs. So you can either have like a nice live LY ready on a mono leader, or you can have these swim baits. And that's probably going to be your best two things to get on the bike. Yeah. And these tarpon are big fish. They can be 100 to 150 pounds very easily. So um, the bigger rod reel setups are going to be a little better for them. I like, a, you know, that eight to nine foot rod, a uh, braided line, a, you know, a pretty decent sized reel, um, whether it's a, you know, a 7,500, 8,500 size reel. Um, you need, I'd say, 40 or 50 pound braid works fine. Um, mono or fluorocarbon leader, again, um, you could, you know, either do a single hook tied on there with no weight or like that, no swivel, or the same s setup but with a swim bait on it. Um, and uh, you know, any, they'll need other kind of live baits besides, besides the LYs or scales. Are usually called they'll eat the um, the the herrings and the pseudomonas and stuff too. But it does seem like they kind of get keyed in on those. Those LYs, those greenbacks, people call them. Uh, and you can catch some of those at the Massachusetts wreck a, a lot of days when, when it's time uh, for the, the tarpon to start rolling through here. There's a, you know, usually the end of May that the, the, the bait kind of shows up, and then the, the tarpon show up a few weeks later. So, um, you know, having some good live baits is definitely going to put you in a good position. And uh, this is also one thing, you know, if you're, like you said, the, the pier is a great place to try to catch a tarpon. You can go there early in the morning uh, to the pier, and you'll see these fish swim by. Um, you know, in, in a, a school of tarpon, how many can you expect to see? And what, what's the normal for uh, when you see the tarpon? How many could it be? So a lot of times you'll just see ones, twos, threes, fours. But uh, once the main push of fish get here, a lot of times you're seeing 50 or 100 in a school. It'll be, you know, it could be a real large school. Um, we've had days out there on the pier where literally there was 20 or 30 people hooked up out of the same school of fish. So, I mean, you, you definitely can see, you know, 50 to 100 is a normal day or like a normal school. And all this depends on the day, too. Sometimes they're spread out up and down the beach and all you see is five or ten fish all day long. And then sometimes you don't see any for a couple hours and it's 200 of them. It just depends. Yeah. And, um, you know, carpet fishing, you know, a sight fishing for a long, for out of a boat, I'd say it's probably new within maybe the last five or six years, seven years. Uh, 12 years ago, I don't think anyone did it around here regularly. And they, it, they, you know, it wasn't very effective or whatever, but uh, people have learned and, and they've kind of adapted and figured out how to catch these tarpon um, when they're coming down the beach. So like you said, they're going to be a little further offshore than the other species we talked about. Um, could, you know, could just probably either on the second sandbar where you can see them really well or just past the second sandbar. And a lot of times too, you know, once you see a few tarpon, like so sometimes we'll just run down the beach and kind of wait till we see them. Maybe not even try to catch the first school that you see. Just try to get a line or an area. The tarpon are, are very, you know, let me talk about too, the pop of the redfish or the jacks will kind of follow the same line. Tarpon are big, big about that too. So they'll kind of find a, a path that's very easy for them that day or, um, you know, they just kind of get stuck on that line. And, and you'll see multiple schools in the same zone. Um, so it's, that's also one, you know, 
one way of sight fishing where we kind of sit still and you can let the target come to you is, is very effective. Whether, whether when we're popping up fishing, most time we're looking for them, kind of moving the boat. Um, and the tarpon, though, like you said, they're super skittish. Uh, they're very boat shy. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, you, you get too close to them. They, they spook before you can ever even get a cast off to them. Um, but, you know, sitting still and waiting for the tarpon to come to you is a very effective way. You can anchor. Um, you know, I, I'd say probably, you know, we have a lot, we have troll motors on our boat and they, they keep you in, in the spot, but sometimes they can be a little loud, make a little bit of noise. So maybe even anchoring uh, in, in this you know, tarpon fishing situation can be a little better. Um, and also, you kind of want to have it where you can ditch your anchor if you need to. Uh, if you get a bite, you put a, a, a float or a life jack on your anchor line, and you can just throw it over so you have to haul your anchor in and, and deal with that. So if you do hook up to one. Um, and uh, what area, what zone of the beach would you say, you, if you were going to go tarpon fishing, where do you start or, or uh, if you were in a boat? So we do uh, see quite a few of them on the west shoal every year. We see a bunch of them on the east shoal just right outside the pass. Uh, anybody that I know that halfway takes it seriously, they end up running down uh, a pretty good ways down to the east. A lot of the guys go down around Portofino, which is down here at the end of the beach. Um, but really, like you were saying, if you can ride down the sandbar and you end up running over a couple schools on a line, and if you see you know, a, a school or two, then you're right there where you need to be anyway. I would just stop right there. I don't usually go very far down to the east, um, but we definitely catch a bunch of them right around the pass, just right there on the east shoal. Yeah, and... Um... You know, one thing, like, if, if we were going to be setting up tarpon fishing on the beach, you really don't want to be right in line with where they're coming. So you, you want to put your boat within casting range, either north or south of the line of fish, to where when you see them coming, you kind of get set up, pitch your, throw your bait out in front of them, and don't necessarily have them come straight to your boat. So, um, you know, that's, that's one way, you know, just when you're getting set up, if you want to try to catch a tarpon, um, you know, maybe set up. If you see a school of them, uh, set up on the outside of them and then be still be in range where you can throw to them, but not necessarily where they come right underneath your boat. So, um, you know, that, that's, that's the, the, the basics of getting set up when you're talking fishing. Um, you know, from the pier, um, you know, what are some things you look for when you're on the pier? If you want to look for them on the pier, uh, are they going to be at the end or the, the shallow or does it matter? Um, I will say... If I am going out there to the pier and I'm tarpon fishing, the first thing I'm going to do, like first thing in the morning, I always start pretty shallow. So maybe right at the beginning of the second sandbar. But if you're out there for any time at all, especially if there's a few fish moving through, you're going to notice what line they want to be on that day. Usually they're, for whatever reason, they always seem to start in close. And as the sun starts getting up, I always start working out, um, you know, working out towards the middle of the sandbar, even on the color change, if you can, depending on which pier you're on. Uh, a lot of times late in the afternoons, they get hard to see, and we'll just see them coming around the end of the pier. It's not, uh, we're actually literally just throwing baits out at that point, and you'll see them kind of come out from nowhere. You have no clue there's fish there, and then you'll just hook one randomly. Even even if you got a 100 or 150-pound fish, sometimes they're pretty sneaky too. But I would say generally, um, I start shallow early in the morning, and I start working out as the sun gets up. Yeah, and you know when, when you're looking for these tarpon, you know, they are a silver-sided fish. They have a very dark back, so that's the you know one of the telltale signs. Uh, if they're not rolling, like Kenny said, they'll come up and like breach and take a gulp of air. If they're not doing that. You see, uh, you know, it's a school of fish. A lot of times, it's going to be ten or fifteen fish, um, but you see the tops of their backs. It's dark colored, either a little black, you know, from where you are, or dark green, and, and you can see them pretty easy. They they kind of move, you know, decently slow. They just kind of kick around. Um, but, you know, one thing when we're talking about on the pier, you can see them a lot better. You see them a little further away. You have a lot of the elevation helps you out there. Um, but also the, the bait around the pier kind of makes them like it's like a, a, a feeding trigger. Whenever they get to that pier, they see that bait, they'll start feeding and you'll see them rolling and eating the baits that are around the pier. So that's where you have an advantage fishing from the pier versus the boat. Um, when you're on the boat, your baits could be the only ones that are anywhere near where you're fishing. When you're on the pier, they're, they're kind of getting, you know, little bit fired up they're feeding a little bit they'll come and see them um they'll roll um you know it, it, a lot of times you know that good skull beer and the bar beer or you know blue some beer there's there could be you know uh, you know the, the bait skull could go out 100 feet off the end of the pier off the side of the pier and you'll just see uh, a hole in, in the in the bait what, what does the hole mean when you see like, like a, a clear spot in the middle of the bait uh, that generally is, you know, when they kind of, sh if they'll sneak in and you don't see a big school of fish coming and it it'll be like, a, like you say, it'll be a dark cloud of bait out there, sometimes 150 yards around the pier. Like you can't see anything but bait fish. 
when you see that big hole open up, that's usually when one of them comes up off the bottom, you know, up into this school of eight. And it could be a hundred of them if there's if the, the bait gets real dark. But if you see that big hole open up, you definitely want to try to throw into that. And you can also, like I said, the swim baits work really well in the pier, too. Uh, the live baits work excellent. And they'll even eat dead bait sometimes. But the thing about the, the swim bait is you get multiple chances. Uh, sometimes you can throw your bait, your live bait off, or your natural bait, throw it off of there. So then you have to go find another one or catch another one. Uh, the swim bait, you have it ready all the time. You can be ready to throw whenever you either see a fish or a hole pops up. And it's just a little bit faster reaction time. And a lot of times they eat that swim bait very well on the pier. Uh, I'd say it probably works better on the pier than from the boat. I think live baits work better from the boat. You can definitely catch them, um, you know, from the boat also. So one other thing, too, uh, the, the, they're catching tarpon on the beach at a kayak. Do you know where, where, they, where they do that at or how they set up when they kayak fish for them? Uh, a lot of those guys I know do it down there around Portofino also. There's some reef balls that are down there. Um, I think it's about a mile or two past Portofino, but those big schools at Elwise will get all over those reef balls. And uh, those guys will paddle out early in the morning and catch their bait on their kayaks, and then they'll put the mailwise out around the reef balls. And the reef balls are acting just like the pier does. It holds bait all summer long, and then fish are going to come to it. They can sense those bait schools, and they're going to be coming in there to go feed. Yeah, and one other place, too, they catch them is down. It's uh, on, like, the Johnson's Beach side, right there behind the, the condos that are furthest to the to the east on Johnson's Beach. And um, and the kayak guys will paddle out there. There's bait to catch there. A lot of times they catch the garments and stuff. Um, but but they can even like build a control around right in there, and it's usually an early bite right when they're under daylight, uh, within the first hour of daylight. And uh, those fish, I don't know if it's something that holds those fish there, but it seems like those fish are kind of there early in the morning. Uh, and and the guys, you know, either cast to them or they just get bites while they're just kind of floating baits around there. So um, this carbon fishery to our area is kind of new, um, but you know we've been catching them you know, for 15, 18 years on the piers since we were young, uh, it just wasn't, you know, you could throw at a thousand tarpon and get zero bites. It seems like the last few years they've been biting a little better. People get shots at them, they hook up and that kind of stuff, uh, more so than it used to be. So it definitely could be cycles where the tarpon are just feeding in our area, but their main objective is migrating. And that's why sometimes they, they're not going to eat anything. They just want to move. They want to get down the, down the road and, and head towards Louisiana. So, um, but the tarpon are definitely, you know, a, a large game fish. Um, they're not going to be a fish you can eat, so it's definitely just for sport. Um, you know, no one really keeps them. Uh, and, you know, people get a, a picture of them in the water and then and then turn them loose. Uh, was, not really a fish you want to take out of the water. He was uh, he was asking how we would how you would release one off a of pier. Uh, so, you know, he, he asked, over here is a decent question. If you hook one on the pier, they say, how do you release one? So there's two ways to do it. Um, you know, some people will, will take the fish to the beach and then have someone get in the water and, you know, unhook it and wrangle it from in the water. And then, uh, the other way you would do it is just, is just try to break it off. So if you have a swim bait or something like that, sometimes you can freeze pull and the fish will shake the jig out of their, of their mouth once you get them to the pier. Uh, a lot of times, though, you maybe have to go to the beach with a swim bait or a lure of some sort and try to de-hook them. Um, if you have a, a circle hook on there and you can break it off at the leader by pulling on it. That's what we do most of the time is just breaking the fish off. Um, you know, fish live very well with hooks in their mouth. So it, it's not something to worry, to worry about. They'll rust out in a, you know, a couple of weeks or so. Um, but you know, the, letting them go is, is definitely important. If you do catch one on a boat, you can even kind of just like idle with it, hold onto the fish and then turn them loose nice and easy. Um, you know, trying to, trying to turn them, turn them loose in best shape possible is, is definitely uh, what you want to do. You don't want to net one or try to gap one off the pier. Uh, so it'd be uh, frowned upon. Any other questions about tarpon fishing or anything in particular? You know, so, you know, this this beach fishing, um, it, it is one thing, like you said, we, we kind of have specifics on our rod and reels, um, but, but we, we always say casting is very important. You want to be able to cast accurately. Um, you want to have a variety of, of lures and setups available uh, when you do go, whether it's looking for redfish, you want to have, you know, gulp, Gulp jerk baits and bucktails and live baits or shrimp. Uh, Pompano fishing, you want to have a couple different colored jigs, varieties of jigs, um, and then different weights, and then some stuff to tip them with. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's something that we grew up doing, and, and you know, it's it's very very addicting once you kind of get used get good at it and start catching a few fish. And also another thing, like you can start out doing, um, you know, Spanish bluefish, ladyfish. Um, you know, that, that's a good way to get started, you know, seeing something in the water, throwing at it, getting it to eat. So if you wanted to try to catch those species, 
Um, what's a good time to do that, and, and where would you start doing that? So um, some of those are already starting to move through now. The, uh, the Spanish, they've been catching off book piers. Um, you can definitely catch the Spanish off the beach some days. Um, sometimes they are a little bit deeper, um, but you could use, like, a gotcha lure works really well, some silver spoons. These pompano jigs work really well for the Spanish, too, and a lot of times you'll, uh, they have, the, this one's called a hex head jig. All the local stores are going to have it. Um, but all those are moving through now. Usually when this water hits 65 or 66 degrees, everything kind of wakes up. So your Spanish and your bluefish are moving through, uh, here in another couple of weeks, usually about mid-April, the ladyfish and all that stuff kind of trail behind them. They like that little bit warmer water. Um, but definitely, the, they'll eat your pompano jigs, the Spanish will eat. They're, they're not near as picky. Gotcha lure, the white lure, the pink lure, they're a lot, uh, they're, they're not near as picky as everything else. Yeah, and, and those are, like, like I said, if you're just getting into sight fishing and you want to have be productive, that's going to be a good way to start for sure. Um, you'll see the, the Spanish swimming down the, the sandbar you'll, or and the, the bluefish and the ladyfish will be there too. You'll see schools though, you can see them jumping on the surface. Um, but you know, throwing, get, you know, getting used to throwing at a fish or throwing at a school of fish and working a lure and, and you know, getting a reaction out of that fish and uh, and getting bites and catching them, it, it's just a good way to uh, to get rolling w with that. Yes, sir, you have a question? Yeah. Are you talking about for the lure? For like for, a lure? That's about a weight. What kind of weight are you going to be using? Um, so typically, just, just the weight of the lure. So this lure could be a, a half ounce or a three quarter ounce, and uh, you, you don't need any additional weight. Um, it's just going to be a lure tied on the end of your line. So, um, you know, the swim bait, these are weighted. Uh, there's a weight in there. Um, the gotcha lure is weighted. The spoons are pretty heavy. Uh, you don't, you don't, pretty much all of this fishing is either going to be just a hook tied on the end of your leader, uh, and then, or a jig or a lure tied on the end of your leader. Um, you don't really want any additional weights or, or swivels or beads or anything like that. Just use the lure the way that it comes. Um, if you are going to be targeting like ladyfish, Spanish, just bluefish, uh, maybe a little, a little piece of wire, maybe some 27 pound wire or some like 50 pound mono. Uh, will help not lose a bunch of lures, and they can be kind of expensive. But, um, you know, it's it, going out there, and, and this is like I said, you know, from the beach, you can definitely catch ladyfish, Spanish, and bluefish, and that kind of stuff. And, and you know, certain situations, you have a good chance for redfish and pompano. Um, but, the, but the piers is a great place to start out looking and trying to see, um, you know, what you're looking for, how they react in the water. And uh, it can be, you know, very, very exciting way to catch all these species. Um, whereas, you know, a little bit different than trolling, um, where you just put the lures out behind the boat and drive around. Uh, it, some people want a little bit more out of it than just, you know, putting rods in the rod holders and fishing. Um, but you can also catch some of these species trolling down the beach as well. Um, you know, same areas we're talking about. Um, you can catch the jacks and the the uh, Spanish and ladyfish and bluefish trolling in the same areas. But once you catch one trolling, maybe start looking around and then start throwing lures and see if you can catch them on a lure. It's a lot of fun. It just mixes it up a little bit and, uh, it, you know, maybe change the way you fish where you didn't do it before. So um, any other questions, guys? So we'll, uh, we'll start to get wrapped up here. And um, anyone need a raffle ticket before we give out a couple of shirts and hats and a rod reel and stuff? All right, we'll get a few raffle tickets coming to you guys. Again, guys, we want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And uh, thanks to Flounders for giving us a spot to, to give this seminar. Here in Whitey.